Hello and welcome to another Sprues and Brews unboxing. Today we are looking at Sundered Fate, the new expansion for Warcry. So not long ago the, the new edition of Warcry kicked off with the awesome uh, box set. I was delved into the, uh, the Gnarlwood um, for a new edition of the game. And Hot on its heels is the first box following this Sundered Fate. So this is really kind of like a, an expansion box. It doesn't have the core cool rules in there. What it does have is two awesome warbands, some new scenery, and, and the rules for all the stuff in the box as well. So you do need those core cool rules if you're going to use it. But there's nothing to stop you picking up the individual rule book and using it alongside this. So in this video, what we're going to do is have a look at the uh, the, the set, have a look through the rules, see what the warbands uh, you know fight like in the game, and then hopefully by the end of the video, I should have at least some of the models painted up so we can see what they look like in the flesh too. First of all, I want to say a massive thanks to Games Works for sending us an early review copy for free to have a look at and unbox on the channel. I'm really excited for this one. I'm a big fan of the Seraphon and some of the range is quite dated. So to get some awesome new chameleon skinks in here is uh, is really cool. And we've also got the weird uh, Jade Obelisk, I think they're called, the kind of Zinchian cult. So yeah, interested to see what they look like. So before we crack it open, let's flip over the box and just have a look at the content on the back. So we've got the Hunters of Hanachi, the uh, the Chameleon Skink Warband, which most excitingly contains some little ba baby pterodactyl things, terror wings, so they look really, really cool. Uh, against them we've got the Jade Obelisk, who are a, a Zinchian cult, I believe, um, who I think are slowly turning to Jade. Uh, obviously when we get into the the stealth and stone book we'll have a look through that properly uh, also in here is some new scenery now the scatter terrain is the same the three scenery pieces initially i thought two of them were exactly the same but they're not as we go through the uh, the assembly instructions elements of them are the same but the platform uh, kind of arrangement is different on these two uh, and then this is an entirely new piece as well. So again, that'll be a nice way of expanding the uh, the scenery from the initial box. And then like with all the Warcry stuff, all the kind of rule cards and stuff are in there as well. And then the full Stealth and Stone kind of expansion book that takes you through the kind of background of the factions and uh, all the kind of campaign stuff in there as well. So without further ado, should we crack this open and have a look what is inside? So slightly smaller box than the other one, um, but no less exciting. So if we take this off, We'll stick that to one side. First of all, we'll have a look at the scenery inside. So, you will see that a couple of these frames are the same as the ones that were in the uh, the original box. So that piece there, and we have got, in fact, these two are new, so we'll have a look at this one. This is the large piece that is in the center of the uh, the map on the, uh, the picture of the back. Some nice detail on this one. Um, I was kind of expecting them to do a whole kind of new range of scenery for each box where it looks like it might all be set within the Gnarlwood but we get variations on the existing trees along with a couple of new pieces as we go along. Now I was kind of expecting as we get closer to the uh, the Seraphon ship we might start to see the ruins of that too. Um, again, I don't know anything, maybe we do. That would be certainly very cool though. This looks like it goes with that piece that we've just seen as well to build the new uh, the new scenery piece for the box. So again, very similar style to the uh, the original stuff out of the uh, the first box. Uh, we did do a painting guide over on sprueandbrews.com as well. So I'll be using that to remind myself how I painted them. And then if you want to quickly get the contents painted up, it only took me a couple of days to paint it using that stuff. So that's another new scenery frame there. And then we have got this, I think. Yep, this looks like one out of the original set with the kind of like uh, skull getting consumed by the uh, gnarl roots there. So I won't dwell on that one too long because we have seen it before. And we have got the same kind of accessory sprue with the bridges and the little bits of scatter terrain on there as well. So that is also an existing frame. Now what is new are the two new war bands. So we've got the Jade Obelisk, so this is the weird kind of like the Zinchun cult. So let's have a close look at these because these guys look pretty cool. And uh, so we've got a range of different weapon options on these two to make them a nice varied force to play with, which is pretty cool. But yeah, they look cool. I'm looking forward to painting these guys up. They look a bit 
weird. And I don't think they're um, the Slaves of Darkness as such because they're not in the new Slaves of Darkness battle tome. So like with the Nurgle warband out of the original box, um, looks like these are going to be more dedicated to their individual gods. The time of filming this, I don't know what the AOS rules will be for these, but presumably they'll be up on uh, Warcom. So they look really nice. And then the one I'm really excited for are these skinks. So these are the Chameleon skinks. And again, really, really nice kit. Love the detail on like the uh, the shields and stuff. Some really fun stuff going on there. Yeah, I'd love to see some new like Source Warriors release for Age of Sigma. Just because the current ones are a little bit dated now. Uh, these look really cool. I also love the little baby pterodactyls. That's probably my favourite element of the kit. I uh, absolutely need to get those painted. If there's one thing I get painted from this box before the review goes out, it's going to be a baby pterodactyl. Because, you know, that's ace, isn't it? So, that is the uh, the uh, chameleon skink frame. That's not everything in the box, though, because we've still got a few goodies in here. So we'll take off this little protector. We've got the stealth and stone rule book, which, again, we'll have a look at in a bit more detail in a little bit, just to see how the warbands play. We have got the Warcry Sundered Fate instructions, showing how we put them all together. Bases for everything in the box. We do have cards. Uh, these are used in games of Warcry to kind of, you can draw to work out the layout of the battlefield, so that's really handy. So we get a deck of those. And we also get the, I think the fighter cards will be in there as well. And then the, the rules for the Warband. So like I say, we'll be looking at these in a bit more detail later on. You also get a full Warcry board as well. Again, themed around the uh, the Gnarlwood. I believe that's the same design as the um, the existing one. And what you can do is put multiples of these together to make an Age of Sigmar plane surface. Uh, before we dig into the rules for the Warband though, and the, uh, the, the Stealth and Stone kind of supplement, what we'll do is have a quick look at the instructions of how these guys go together. Just see if there's anything we spot in here. So yeah, quite a few kits to build um, in this one. Uh, Seraphon instructions first. In Warcry, a lot of the time, you'll have different models that build different loadouts. So one of the things that you probably want to do first is just work out how you want to build your entire warband. Um, on average, these boxes come to a, you know, a thousand points worth of stuff, but there might be some options that are better than others. So just make sure you have a read through first and uh, you know build what you're going to be using. That said, there's nothing wrong with the rule of cool. Um, I don't think you'll be able to build this up anyway and not have a legal force. So if you think a loadout looks cool, go for it and build it. Sometimes rule of cool is the way to go, especially when you're learning how to play the game as well. So flicking through, it looks like a couple of these do have different options for, for different weapons. Um, so yeah, it looks like you are gonna have to have a look at that first. Um, the terror wings just go together one way though. They're pretty fun. Yeah, they look really cool painted up. I can't wait to uh, to build them. Uh, and then the jade obelisk as well at the Zinchian court. Again, it looks like we've got a few different options, so just keep an eye on that. I quite like his uh, sculpted base that kind of goes on top of the normal base too. That's quite interesting. Uh, and yeah, it looks like you have got a lot of options here. So most of them have got either picks or hammers. The ranged guys can also be built as close combat guys. So again, I'd probably have a proper look through the rules first and work out how you want to build them. Um, or try and build them so you've got a variety of all the other weapon options if you do want to do it like that. Um, just make sure... You know, you, you've worked out what you want to build first because you don't want to build them and then end up not being able to use them all. So, yeah, just uh, have a scan through, work out which loadout you want to do first. Um, at the time of filming this, I haven't seen the rules for these yet, so I wouldn't be able to recommend one way or the other. Towards the end of the video, I might have some pointers towards what's the stronger builds, what you want to go for. I suspect you want some ranged in there as well with these guys, just because that's quite useful as a utility. Uh, going on to the scenery, the scatter terrain builds exactly the same way as the Heart of Gerstoff, where these, I believe, go together slightly differently. So this bit at the bottom's new, and you've got this little expansion kind of bit onto it too. So that just builds up the profile of the tree, 
ever so slightly, um, which is quite interesting. It means that they'll be able to bring out new kits and just kind of vary the look of this stuff. Uh, I'm a big nerd for building scenery, so I really enjoy it. So looking forward to seeing how this all goes together. Uh, again, with this one, it's the stock tree, and then I think one of those frames that I showed earlier has got all the extra bits that then change the kind of profile of the tree and add the new platforms, which does mean that while it shares a lot of the kind of similarities to the other one, there is going to be kind of merit in having multiples, especially for games of Warcry where different multiple levels and stuff are quite handy. With an assortment of different trees, you'll be able to put together some quite different battlefields. So that's pretty cool. And then finally, we've got the new piece as well. That's quite cool looking. Yeah, really looking forward to uh, building these up. Now I do notice on some of these, it recommends painting some of these internal details first to make it easier to uh, to get to. So I'll be looking at how to put that together in sub-assemblies um, just to see you know, how to make it as easy as possible to paint that. Um, I think with it being quite a hollow terrain piece, you're gonna struggle to eat your brushing if you do build it all in one go. So. I would just watch out where it's calling to paint them up separately, just to make life a little bit easier for yourself. So yes, yeah, so that is all the scenery in the box. Uh, what we're going to do now is have a look at the, uh, the the book itself, have a look at the rules for the warbands and see how they fight. So let's take a look at the stealth and stone supplement. So this is basically a, a mini battle tome for the two factions in the box with the rules for the Jade Obelisk and the uh, the chameleon skinks uh, and if you've got the the previous uh rotten ruin i think it was called the the first one out of the um the the gnarlwood box uh, very much the same format so the first part of the book is all about new law you get about 21 pages off the top of my head uh, exploring the ravening ruin which is the area where this uh this supplement takes place so basically the forces have started to dig deeper into the gnarlwood now so, um, you know, they've got through the initial kind of defences, all the ravenous gnarl oaks, and, and they're starting to get further in. And within here, we learn that the uh, the Seraphon ship has actually got some, like, terraforming uh, technology in it that is used to, you know, create life and uh, uh, basically terraform the environments that the, the slan would be going to. Now, unfortunately, with the, the ship crashed and the, uh, the kind of the crew of the ship dead, it's kind of gone back onto its kind of pre, pre set up uh, defensive measures where in order to hide the ship, it has started kind of growing kind of thick vegetation around the ship itself, which is pretty cool. So from a, um, a law point of view, the, the kind of fragments of the ship are overgrown so you can't see them and it's difficult to get into the centre of the Norwood because all these kind of big thorns and stuff have grown up around the ship itself. Um, so that's pretty cool. It's a shame we haven't got to the ship itself yet. I imagine later on in this story arc we'll get to the um, Talaxis and hopefully get some scenery pieces to reflect it because I think that'll look really, really good on the table. Some, um, you know, some different pieces of scenery to represent the crash ship. I think a nice kind of... Uh, gnarlwood themed AOS table will look good with the kind of gnarl oaks and then the ruined ship so obviously we haven't got that far yet but, but hopefully uh, we then learn about the two factions in the box as well the Jade Oblisk are really cool so basically they were a um, I, I guess a, a race of um, smiths and crafters who excelled at their art but unfortunately a load of them fell to the forces of chaos uh, until a single kind of tribe survived and inside their citadel they had a Jade Oblisk and the kind of the leader of that tribe started carving some strange runes and markings into it and uh yeah then the stone started talking which isn't normally a great sign and then a demon climbs his way out and makes a deal with them he will make them as strong and as durable as as the jade that he's crawled out of and the tribe happily accept this uh, this deal before realizing that the downside of this is eventually they will turn to jade and then crumble away to nothing but it's fine, because the demon's got another deal for them. He's uh, like, okay, cool. Well, I'll stop you from crumbling away to nothing in exchange for human sacrifice. So the Jade Obelisk are kind of stuck in this endless loop 
where they're in servitude to this demon, where they have to keep offering sacrifices to him in order to stay alive, and their bodies are slowly like crystallizing as they go. So it's really cool. It's nice to see a Chaos faction from kind of the point of view of I guess an unwitting follower of Chaos, where they've accepted this deal and then it's all immediately gone very, very wrong. They're not inherently evil as such, but they've got to keep doing these sacrifices in order to stay alive. So quite like that, they're, they're quite fun. On the other hand, we've got the um, the, the Hunters of Hunachi, the, uh, the Seraphon warband here. And again, they're, they're, they're quite different. The ship's crashed and, and, and most of the, the, the crew are dead and the slam's dead. And this team of um, chameleon skinks has been kind of spawned in order to kind of protect the ship and deter any travellers that are getting too close to it. Um, unfortunately, the exposure to the Norwood is slowly sending them slightly mad as well. So they're becoming more aggressive and feral and there are talk of some Seraphon creatures that have ventured out into the Norwood and not returned and now they're just savage beasts. And yet yeah, these guys are on the verge of being corrupted by the Norwood itself. However, um, in the absence of their slam lord, they've actually started worshipping a giant gold statue of him. Which is weird, but uh, apparently it's got some kind of healing powers and as long as they return to this statue and the kind of like healing pools around it, it does kind of like um, lessens the corruptive effects of the Narwood. So as long as they keep doing that, they're fine. But obviously as these battles get more and more prolonged and they get stuck out in the wilderness longer, there is a chance that these guys are going to slowly fall into their feral nature as well. Now whether that's the uh, influence of the incarnates, maybe, um, because the Kron Spine Incarnate obviously is making people kind of more more wild and feral as well. So whether the, the Narwood's got a similar effect on living things. But um, yeah, I quite like these that they're, they're, they're quite, quite mad worshipping this gold statue. Um, but they know they've got to protect the ship and do the right thing. So again, pretty cool to see a different take on the, um, the chameleon skinks as well. So yeah, really cool. We then get into the rules content itself and obviously a lot of people wanting to pick up the uh, the box will be interested in how the two different warbands perform and they are very different from a kind of um, gameplay point of view. So first up we've got the J Doblisk. These are quite tough and resilient. So they've got a decent amount of wounds, they have a decent toughness and they've got some abilities that make them quite resistant as well. So their reaction, the Curse of Jade, fighter can make this reaction when they're targeted by a melee attack uh, before the hit rolls are made, subtract one for the damage points allocated to the fighter by each hit and critical hit to a minimum of one. So that's really, really cool. Uh, but not only can they do that, they can also heal themselves as well. So with the double ability Stone Warp, the fighter can use this ability if they're within nine inches of a visible friendly fighter uh, who's an icon bearer, so the guy with the big thing on his back. Uh, remove a number of damage points allocated to the fighter equal to half the value of the ability. If it's also within six inches of a priest, you can remove the full number. So if you've got, I don't know, double six, you can, if you're near a priest and you're also near the icon bearer, you can remove six wounds, which is really, really good. It's kind of a, it's kind of tempted to have a couple of those icon bearers within your army, just to um, kind of maximize the aura of this healing ability, because that's double. That's quite easy to do and keep your guys topped up, especially if you can lessen the damage incoming as a reaction. It's gonna be quite hard to shift them. Uh, the other bit is pretty cool, so uh, hammering strikes are double. Fighting uses the ability of an enemy fighter has been allocated damage points as an attack at half the value to the damage points allocated, which is really nice. Uh, rock shattering blow is a double, add one to the strength characteristic for the next melee attack action made by the fighter and add one to the damage points allocated. Uh, triple but bloody tribute is really nice if somebody does manage to take out any of your guys. Um, basically you pick a friendly fighter within nine inches and you get a bonus move action, which is pretty cool. Uh, Gaze of the Adlocks. This is the weird like demon creature that's accompanying them and it's quite fragile if you look at the profile uh, on the right hand side there. But this is pretty cool. It's a triple. You pick a visible enemy fighter within nine inches and you subtract half the value of the ability from either their move or their toughness. So say if you had now had a triple five, you could use this to remove three from their toughness, making it really, really easy for your guys to go in and finish them off. So really like that one, it's, uh, it's quite cool. And then finally, Might of the Speakers, their quad. 
Pick a friendly fighter uh, within a number of inches equal to the value of this ability. Add three if there's a friendly uh, priest on the battlefield. That fighter can take two move actions, attack actions or disengage actions in any combination. They're bonus actions as well. So yeah, I really like the J-Bob list. I think they're going to be quite good. Uh, it's going to be quite hard to chew through them and they've got a lot of kind of aggressive abilities to pour more damage on things too. So I think they're going to be pretty nice. We've also got the uh, the skinks, the Hunters of Hunachi. Uh, these are fragile, but they're fast. They don't do an awful lot of kind of damage, but they're going to be tricksy and hard to kind of like play against. So as you can see over on the right hand side, they're not very tough. You've got toughness size of what, twos, threes, eight wounds on your little grunts. Damage wise, most abilities are doing ones unless they get a critical. So yeah, not a lot of, lot of output, but they have got some shenanigans. They've got low ranged attacks, and they're very fast. In particular, Terror Wings with their movement 10 as well. Um, they're pretty cool. Now what makes them kind of quite powerful is their reaction, Slippery. So they can make the reaction after they've been allocated damage, um, and then you can make a free disengage. Well, not a free disengage, but a disengage is a reaction. So if somebody's trying to pin you in combat, you can do that Slippery reaction fall back and then with your remaining action then shoot them or, or run off somewhere else, jump on an objective. So yeah, they're going to be quite slippery and uh, tricksy and hard to pin down. Now I guess the only thing going against that is they are quite weak so you're going to be wounding them quite easily and they haven't got many hit points. Um, so they're probably going to be able to do that trick once each and then the next time they're a goner. But that's, you know, Warcry games move quite quickly. So being able to just like fall out of combat and run away somewhere else to maybe get an objective is quite a good ability to have. Uh, the other ones, again, kind of play into this. So Agile's a double until the end of the activation. They don't count the vertical distance for um, terrain, which is cool. Uh, double envenomed weapons add one to the damage of each hit in critical hit. Handy again, so quite low damage. Uh, hold bowlers are quite cool. So this is on the kind of like melee armed chameleons. Um, and basically, you um, pick an enemy fighter within 8 inches of this fighter and roll a number of dice equal to the value of the ability. If one of the dice scores a 6, then the fighter makes one fewer action this battle round. Um, if the fighter is reduced to 0 actions in this way, the fighter cannot be activated in the battle round. So that's pretty cool for reducing the activations and just kind of holding the decent kind of enemies at bay. Uh, Battle with the Carnosaur, that is done by the guy with the core hat. What is he? Hunichi's Claw, he's called. Uh, pick an enemy fighter within 6 inches of this fighter. Until the end of the battle round, subtract 1 for the move characteristic of this fighter. And subtract 1 for the damage point allocated by each hit. So again, it can be used on a decent one to make them slower, to make them hit not quite as hard. Quite like that one. Uh, Call of the Hunt, that can be used by the guy with the, the horn. Uh, pick a friendly fighter, uh, basically the, the Terror Wings you get to pick within 9 inches. That fighter makes a bonus move action, and then you pick an enemy fighter within an inch of that fighter, and you allocate a number of wounds equal to the dice roll for that ability. So if you have three sixes, for example, you move a terror wing, and then it goes next to somebody and causes six damage to them. So yeah, I really like that one as well to kind of swoop in, especially if you can kind of like chain that and get the terror wing attacking next to finish them off as well. And that's quite cool. And then hit and run is a quad. The fighter makes a bonus move action or a bonus disengage action and then the fighter makes a bonus attack action or bonus move action again keeps them running around quick makes them quite agile they can move quite a lot of distance with all these free kind of like moves and stuff that they're getting so again quite like these i think they're going to be more of a finesse warband um but they're going to be really tricksy and should be good on the objective game so again quite like them what we also get in the book is rules for all of the scenery within the box too. So if you haven't picked up the previous box and you've just got this one and maybe the core rule book or the free rules off their uh, walk on, uh, you've got all the rules in here. So you don't need to worry about, you know, the old scenery piece is not being really printed in there. You've got all the kind of the ruins and scattered terrain. We've got a new piece, the Hollow Refuge. This is one of the new kits built in the box. Uh, basically, safe haven, if you're inside it, you get a free take cover action, so that's pretty cool. And then we've got the Gnarwoods, they have the same, uh, the Gnarl Oak, sorry, they've got the same rules as in the previous uh, box. Better shot here, though, of some of the new pieces on them, so while it's the same kind of core Gnarl Oak for both of them, there are some additional pieces that go on there that just kind of change the silhouette and, and change how they look, so that's quite nice, you'll have different looking gnarle oaks across the two boxes so makes uh, for a more varied table and obviously you're free to mix and match the stuff out of the two boxes as well in your games. 
Uh, and then rope bridges again exactly the same. What we do get in here is something called forest tactics. Basically at the start of the game each player can choose to do one of these actions and they get different benefits for doing them. So forage you can send a guy out to look for a, um, a lesser artifact. Uh, place traps does what it says, you can set some traps that do some damage to an enemy fighter. Uh, wrangle a beast, you get to pick a uh, rune marked beast, what's the word? Thrall rune marked uh, kind of creature to join your warband just for that game. They run away at the end of the game so you don't keep them in a campaign but it's an extra kind of thing that you can bring along. Uh, modify equipment, you can improve your equipment, basically make your uh, move faster, you can make your toughness better, it's pretty handy. Uh, lane ambush again can be used to um, make like a free move with one of your guys and then uh, go native um, basically you you forgo being able to do any cool abilities in order to not have anything from the mission affect you so any twist cards or any abilities so a bit of a trade-off is handy one to have if you need somebody to be immune to all that stuff there and yeah, like, so this, while it's kind of forest tactics themes, you can use these for kind of other games of Warcry as well. So that's pretty fun as well. We then get, like with the other two books, a couple of campaigns in here as well. Again, themed around the forces in the box, but you could use them, uh, certainly the later ones, with uh, with more warbands. So we have um, some Jade Obelisk quests that are unique to them, that they can fight through along with all their uh, artifacts and encampments and stuff like, with the stuff in the, in the core set. And then again, the same again for Hunters of Hanichi. So again, over the course of this like year worth of uh, expansions, uh, we're going to see these for all of the new warbands, so that's quite fun. Now tying all that together, we get a new campaign arc, The War of Stealth and Stone. So this is a three kind of three part campaign, but it has six potential missions in it. And like with the other ones, it's got a bit of a branching tree to determine like, the order of the missions that are played. So if you play through it a couple of times, you should have a different kind of like order to it as well, which is fun. Um, so yeah, really like that. This kind of stuff I love, the kind of narrative, branching, pick your own adventure style stuff that we've seen in uh, previous Warcry stuff is fun. Uh, in addition to that, we get another campaign arc which is designed around two teams of four or six players. So you've got multiple people on each team. Uh, again, it's got a bit of a, uh, a different mechanic to it. It's basically rock, paper, scissors. So one side will pick whether they want to fiercely plunge into the forest, hack and slash, or burn a path. The other side secretly chooses cautious ambush, trap the way or extinguish the flames. And then based on the combination of what you've picked, that will determine the mission that you play. So that's a really nice way of doing it. And then it culminates in a big multiplayer game that kind of ends the, the campaign arc as well. So while you can, you know, play just match player games generated using some stock layouts, I think Warcry really comes into its own when you play through the campaign stuff and the, and the quests and all that core cool kind of narrative element. So I definitely give it a go because it is, it is really, really fun. And then finally, if you haven't got the, um, the cards out of the box, or say if you pick up this book, normally about three months after the box comes out, you can buy the contents of the, uh, the set separately. So in the back of here, they have got the battle plan generator, so all the maps, victory conditions, and twist tables, exactly the same as the cards in the box, but printed in the book in case you, I don't know, you lose them or you don't have them, or you pick up this book after the event, so pretty good. And then finally in the back we get background tables, origins, leader backgrounds for all of the forces in the box too, which again is uh, quite fun for kind of fleshing out your characters and giving them some cool names and stuff. And finally, before we go, just want to look at some of the miniatures in the box because they are gorgeous. Now, sadly, the uh, the Jade Obelisk haven't had a chance to uh, to spray because the weather's been terrible, but they are really, really cool models. And I'm looking forward to uh, to painting these guys up. In particular, this guy here is a really, really nice kit. So um, I don't know if these guys are getting like AOS Zinch rules. I assume they will. There'd be a cool uh, battle line option or even just a, a cool unit to take along for for your Zinch army. I like the little weird demon thing as well. Yeah, really, really cool. Uh, but I think the stars of the show have to be the, uh, the skinks. So we managed to build and spray all these, but I've managed to start painting a couple of them, so in particular the little terror wings 
are amazing. Had a really uh, fun time painting these guys up. Uh, like baby pterodons, basically. But they're really cool. Uh, I coincidentally used um, Duncan Rhodes Two Thin Coats paints to paint up these. Really nice colours in the range, so we'll be doing a bit of a review on them soon as well. But uh, yeah, these were a bit of the, uh, the test bed for using these paints. So I've painted up one of them. And I've also painted up one of the chameleon skinks as well. Again, really, really nice models. I uh, really do hope that the Seraphon gets new things. Uh, if they get a new codex in the new year. New battle tome, sorry. Um because these models kind of blow some of that older stuff out of the water. I'd love to see some new like Saurus Warriors with a similar kind of like style to these. It'd be really, really cool. So yes, yeah, so that was a look at the uh, the new Warcry set. It's uh, it's really, really cool. Lots of cool models in there, lots of scenery in there, uh, loads of lore and kind of fun things to play for your games. Now, what it doesn't have is the core rules. So if you are new to Warcry, you still want to pick them up. Uh, they are available for free over on Warhammer Community. Um, but if you're new, like completely new, um, the original Heart of Gear box may be a better buy for you. That said, this still has the full board, uh, all the scenery, two teams, and all the rules to use them as well. So that's pretty cool. Um, it's interesting that they're staying in the same location, and this is going to expand over the kind of the core box and the three expansions over the course of the year. I really like that because it means by the end of the year. You're going to have a really nice kind of gnarwood themed scenery set, which is cool. Uh, so yeah, interested to see how that plays up. Uh, over on the website, I've also got a full write-up of this box as well. So uh, going into a bit more depth onto the onto the two war bands and the contents of the kind of the law set element on there as well. So if you're interested, check that out. If you have enjoyed this video, uh, why not follow? Give us a subscribe. Um, we do lots of unboxings and reviews and, and painting videos. Uh, the painting stream will be going back soon. Now they're in a new studio, along with some battle reports as well. I want to get some uh, Warcry videos up soon as well. Uh, maybe show off the contents of this once we've got it all painted up. But yeah, until next time, hope you have a great weekend, and we'll see you soon.